buddy. Yeah. We're going we're gonna to do this now, I think, maybe. Woo. Mm. Energy in this room. I love it. All right. So, yeah, you're at Chadev, if you didn't know. This is a Chattanooga developer. Uh, what do we call this? Talks? Developer talks. Yeah, every Thursday we're here. And uh, it's made possible by these people. So they're the ones that give us the money to buy the food that you're putting in your face right now. So thanks. Thank you, Lamp Post Group, Carbon 5, EPB, Colab, Society of Work, and uh, UTC. And Emma. Man, that slide needs to be updated. This is, this is a huge oversight. Emma, we love you. Thank you. Thank you for this. All right. Uh, let's see. Next week, we have uh, David Neal coming up from Dalton. He's based out of Dalton. David's a, uh, he's a pretty well-traveled uh, speaker on the uh, Tech Talk circuit. I think he's uh, just recently back from uh, NDC in Oslo, et cetera, et cetera. He's going to be talking to us about building apps with electrons, so that should be pretty fun. Um, hmm, I think we've got an announcement. Richard, Richard, you want to come? Can you give us a talk? I wanted to let folks know that uh, one of the uh, meetups that's uh, part of CHAWDEV, we call CHAWDEV Ops, uh, is next Tuesday night here and on the fourth floor, 6 o'clock, in the small conference room. And we're going to be taking sort of a deep dive into infrastructure as code and specifically looking at the tool Terraform from HashiCorp. So if you're interested, go to the meetup page and sign up, and we'll see you. All right. Thank you. Okay, so today's speaker came all the way from Nashville, and not only that, but really saved our butts last minute because we had to have a reschedule. So uh, everybody give it up for Anna. That's right. Welcome, Anna. And at the end, when you have questions, uh, make sure to grab this mic. I'm going to have it over here. Flag me down. We need our live streamers to hear you. OK. Can you hear me? I tend to be quiet, so if you can't hear me, tell me to speak up. <laughs> um, today, I'm going to be talking about basically machine translation and kind of a more theoretical discussion of is it an art, is it a science, kind of what are the possibilities, what are the limitations um, that are there in the field. Um, who am I? I'm, my name is Anna. I went to Covenant College just almost, I'm in the process of graduating as we speak, hopefully. Um, I studied computer science, and um, I've been here in Chattanooga for a couple of years. I did work at TVA as an intern for a while. I interned at um, CTS as well, which a lot of you probably know, kind of fell in love with consulting there, and now I'm doing work at a consulting company full time um, called Accenture. Do you want me to? Thank you. It's messy. that work? Okay. Awesome. Um, so Accenture just opened an office in Nashville. I work there um, configuring basically insurance software for a client. And we have a lot of fun. It's kind of like a, a startup culture in a very big company. So I am learning a lot every day and enjoy what I do. Um, today, basically, this is just a brief overview of what I want to talk about. I'll play a quick introductory video, um, go through some basic terminology in the field, and kind of talk about the different fields that are emerging when I'm talking about machine translation, uh, give you just a brief history, and talk about some methodology systems and approaches that are found within machine translation, and then um, a couple of practical applications. Why do we care about machine, machine translation? Uh, talk a little bit about Google Translate, limitations and possibilities in the field, and then kind of just open it up for questions. Um, so this guy is a very famous translator named David Bellis, and he's just going to kind of talk a little more smoothly than I probably could. Just a brief introduction about machine translation. again. Will it come out of my 
Is there any way to make it come? Okay. <laughs> okay, that's totally fine. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. Going for oh, 50 years or so. Back. Okay. Uh, and it has entered really uh, quite a new phase in the last 10, 15 years. I think it's an absolute miracle that um, linguists and computer engineers and other very clever people has a, a relatively short.
All right, thank you for your patience. I knew I probably shouldn't have put a video in there because videos never go well, but there you go. Okay, basic terminology, I'm gonna talk about kind of three overarching fields and I'll kind of show you this in a second, but computer science, artificial intelligence, computational linguistics, all of which are completely intertwined in some different ways, but computer science, which you guys all know, study of computers and their uses and a million different things that fall underneath that. Um, then with artificial intelligence, you've got more the idea of computer science, dealing with giving machines the ability to learn themselves, essentially. Um, the power of a machine to copy an intelligent human, intelligent human behavior. And there's obviously huge debate around this. How far can we really take this? Um, can machines be self-aware, et cetera, et cetera? Um, there's a lot of very smart people that dive into that that know a lot more than I ever will. Um, and then computational linguistics is kind of where computer science meets linguistics, both of which are fields that I am fascinated with, but um, basically applying the technical abilities within CS to these theories that they have in linguistics. Um, okay, and then natural language processing is kind of a merging of those things that I just talked about. So it encompasses machine translation, which is what I'm talking about today. Um, and it's those three fields I was talking about. Computer science, artificial intelligence, computer, computational linguistics, um, and the interactions between computers and then actual human language or natural language. Side note, another term you may have heard thrown around is uh, machine learning. Um, basically, high, high power computers picking up lots of patterns and quote unquote um, learning, so this is kind of a branch of computer science and artificial intelligence that is woven into some of this discussion of machine translation. Um, I'm really visual, so in my head, this is all kind of like these, these four things right here are just kind of like the umbrella that feeds or kind of hangs over machine translation. So you've got those three major fields kind of feeding into what we call natural language processing, and then um, within that is uh, the field of machine translation. Okay, so machine translation, what is it? Um, at its core, it's um, the automation of the entire translation process, which is one of the most daunting things I can think of, but um, essentially computerized systems responsible for the production of translations. Um, some of this, some people will define that with humans helping. Some people will say, no, it needs to be completely automatic automated, but um, like I'm saying down there, basically translators being assisted by computers falls into this in certain, in certain ways, but um, what machine translation isn't is computer-based technology that, um, uh, computer-based translation tools, um, which if you are in the field of translation, you know um, a lot of these tools that translators use kind of across the world today um, have a have a long way to go, but there's also some pretty high th high tech things out there. You know, just like dictionaries and um, things that kind of make the human process of translation speed up. But this is not automation of translation itself. A uh, quick history of machine translation. Um, so even back all the way to the 17th century, you've got guys like. Um, Descartes and Leibniz saying, hey, we should make a universal language. And they, they're trying to do it with numbers, and you've got people kind of pointing to even stuff like Chinese and saying, um, we need like one universal way to communicate so that we can kind of have interaction across, across culture. Um, and you've got Turing, um, the Turing test in the 1950s, if, um, I'm sure a lot of you have seen that movie, but basically what the Turing test, how he kind of defined that was, if you take a human and you say, and you have them interact with something basically behind a veil curtain, it might be a computer, it might be a human, you don't know, and you have them ask that 
human or computer questions. And if the person asking the questions can't tell the difference, they can't distinguish whether or not that's a computer or a person, then you've achieved um, Turing test success or basically the computer has fooled the human into thinking that it is a human too. And so that was kind of how Turing defined it and that was kind of groundbreaking in the field at that time. And so people started getting excited, doing a lot of research. Um, so you've got a lot of work in the late 50s and early 60s and people are really hopeful saying, you know, like, it's all gonna come down the, come down the pipe right now, IBM, MIT, Harvard, Cambridge. We've got all these um, just incredible minds working um, with a lot of hope towards what they thought was gonna be full automation and very soon. And obviously that, that did not happen. And so then you've got some stuff. Um, in 1960, a guy named Barhalil gave a, a review of the progress of machine translation. And he was like, hey, everyone calm down. This, you should all be a little less ambitious here. You've got some underlying assumptions about what's possible when it comes to machines um, that are underlying the idea that you could ever automate translation. Um, 1964, you've got a lot of governments actually supporting um, these translation efforts, um, automated translation efforts, and they sent um, this committee, they put a committee together, and the, res the, basically the verdict that they came to was that there's no immediate predictable prospect of useful machine translation, and that they should instead put their effort towards what I was talking about earlier, which wasn't machine translation, which is just translators' aids, which technology still helps translators a ton, whether or not it's automating the process or not. So they were saying, we should head more in that direction. And after that, the field kind of became taboo, and people were like, oh, it's not going anywhere. So you've got a lot of that in the 70s and 80s, and then you've got some new people coming in, especially in the 80s, 90s, with some new techniques and obviously the internet changes a lot as well, but that's just kind of some quick background on the field. And so talking more about this translation process specifically, um, how, how do you go about making a quality translation via computer? Um, there's three different ways to kind of ensure that it would be a quality quality translation. One is that it's designed for a specific sublanguage. So there's actually a lot of success in the field as far as this goes. So you've got people that are translating something like a patent or polymer chemistry, just something with really specific language and really specific kind of ways that their text is written. And so it's easier to feed a computer the rules to something like that than it is the entire English language or the entire Chinese language, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this, this goes on today. And I mean, that in of itself amazes me. Um, but another way that you could ensure quality of translation would be to really control the input text or the text that you're feeding into the computer that you want to be fed into a target language. Um, but there's kind of debate around that because if you are extensively editing the text you know, that you're feeding in, then that's a, that's a human job. Um, and that's called pre-editing. And while it would, you would have to go through and reduce ambiguity, um, restrict complexity, it can be done and that's, that's how some people choose to approach some of these problems. Um, and then there's kind of a more overarching approach, which is what I found to be called um, interactive mode. So that's kind of like a computer and a human working together. And as the computer reaches points of complexity or conf confusion, as we could call it, um, it, said it, it pops up and says, hey, help me out. And the human kind of interacts back and forth with the program and makes the translation. And although it's automated, it's certainly not fully automated. Um, when I'm talking about kind of these systems that can be developed, there's a couple different kinds. So you've got, um, first of all, either bilingual or multilingual. So you've got ones that are maybe just English to Spanish, Spanish to English, or you know English to all the languages in Eastern Europe. That would be multilingual versus bilingual. 
Um, and then even within that, you've got the idea of unidirectional or bidirectional. So I could make a program that just translates from English to Japanese, but not back from Japanese to English. And um, I actually saw a lot about that. Even like if you were going to go and mess around with Google Translate and type in a sentence to Google Translate and translate it to Japanese and then copy and paste that Japanese back into English, a lot of that coming backwards, you get completely different results. And that's why bidirectional would be a lot more challenging system to create. Um, so then just to touch on kind of approaches that people will take to translation, a lot of what you'll hear about is direct translation, what I was just talking about. One pair of text in one direction, so from one language to another. You've got one source language, one target language, and that's the only way the program goes. Um, then there's what they have like called an interlingua approach. Um, so this is a little more complex and starts to get over my pay grade, but um, basically you take a source text, say you're going to start in Chinese, and you take that Chinese and then you put it in this kind of intermediate meaning representation, and then you take um, that and you take it from the source language to the interlingua, and then that interlingua or that meaning representation in the middle, you put that back into the target language. Um, so say we wanted to go from Chinese to Japanese. Um, you take the Chinese, put it into that interlingua middle phase, and then it would come out in, in Japanese. And then there's the less ambitious transfer approach. Um, so this is three stages instead of two. Um, you've got these kind of two middle grounds here on either side of the source text and target text. So if our source text is Chinese, we put it into that intermediate phase without ambiguities. And then we would um, put it into the Japanese kind of middle phase of kind of that, it's a lot like this idea of interlingua where um, it has less ambiguity, so it goes from that Chinese version of it to the Japanese version, and then from the Japanese version to actual Japanese language. Um, and again, I'm sorry for kind of botching that, but um, it's above my pay grade, and it's complicated, and it's very, I find it fascinating. I would love to study it in grad school, um, but there's a lot that goes on there. And then probably more of a maybe useful discussion for us is like what are some practical applications of machine translation if it even you know has any future at all? Um, like I was mentioning earlier, there's definitely um, Google Translate and that's alive and well today. And I actually have a video about that. I don't know. We can make a call whether or not we want to watch. I think it's like two minutes, but um, it's just a guy kind of being really kind of clearly walking through. Hey, this is how. Google Translate works, and what he's saying is that, and I, this is so cool, but they basically take just millions and millions of documents from all over the internet, and a lot of them are feeding in from places like the UN, um, where you've got like aligned texts that say the same thing in a m ton of different languages. And so it's basically just data mining. So they're taking all of these texts in and noticing the patterns. So when this kind of sentence, hap sentence structure happens, then um, it's translated this way, and over time, the more and more texts that are fed into that program, the more accurate it becomes. And so even if you were to use Google Translate a while back versus today, it's, it's a lot more accurate. Um, and that's exciting and will only continue to, to move forward as basically you just feed more data into it. Um, and the guy was talking about this in the earlier video, but Siri and all forms of voice command are <coughs> kind of in a similar field in the sense, um, so I've talked with some people at Apple before about they basically, they studied natural language processing and now what they do is they do that predictive typing on the iPhone. So like when you're typing something and your phone corrects you and actually tells you what you meant to say, that's, that's a field of AI and um, natural language processing itself. So there's all sorts of, especially when you start um, going into today's technologies, ways that this kind of plays out, but as globalization continues, obviously the world's more interconnected and um, 
the more that the world is interconnected, the more people need to communicate, whether it be for business or any, any millions of reasons, this becomes more pressing. Um, I personally actually did research within the field of Bible translation for my senior research project, but that's just like its own unique problem where there's people, there's actually over 7,000 languages in the world and there's um, a l just thousands upon thousands of them that do not have Bibles in their language at all. And so there's this whole field of people that want to um, translate into these languages that don't have Bibles in their language. And that is a slow, slow process. And so the idea of machine translation becomes pertinent there and kind of a discussion of, you know, could a machine ever do something like that? Could it not? And um, we'll talk a little bit more about implications in a little bit. Um, what do y'all think? Should I try a video or not? Yeah? Okay. If you say so. use a process called statistical machine translation, which is just a fancy way to say that our computers generate translations based on patterns found in large amounts of text. But let's take a step back. If you want to teach someone a new language, you might start by teaching them vocabulary words and grammatical rules that explain how to construct sentences. A computer can learn a foreign language the same way, by referring to vocabulary and a set of rules. But languages are complicated, and as any language learner can tell you, there are exceptions to almost any rule. When you try to capture all of these exceptions, and exceptions to the exceptions in a computer program, the translation quality begins to break down. Google Translate takes a different approach. Instead of trying to teach our computers all the rules of a language, we we'll let our computers discover the rules for themselves. They do this by analyzing millions and millions of documents that have already been translated by human translators. These translated texts come from books, organizations like the UN, and websites from all around the world. Our computers scan these texts looking for statistically significant patterns. That is to say, patterns between the translation and the original text that are unlikely to occur by chance. Once the computer finds a pattern, it can use this pattern to translate similar texts in the future. When you repeat this process billions of times, you end up with billions of patterns and one very smart computer program. For some languages, however, we have fewer translated documents available, and therefore fewer patterns that our software has detected. This is why our translation quality will vary by language and language pair. Our translations aren't always perfect, but by constantly providing new translated texts, we can make our computers smarter and our translations better. Next time you translate a sentence or web page with Google Translate, think about those millions of documents and billions of patterns that ultimately led to your translation and all of it happening in the blink of an eye. Pretty cool, isn't it? Give it a try at translate.google.com. Okay. Sorry again for the, I didn't really make it loud enough, but. Um, <laughs> what'd you say? Yeah, oh yeah, it's still going in the back. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so, basically the question here is, what are the limitations in the field? What are the, what are the possibilities? And we've kind of already gone over this, but language is complex. Um, there's a million exceptions and nuances. You see this every day in how you, how we talk in the South versus how people talk in the North. And, how 16-year-olds talk versus how 40-year-old businessmen talk. So you just got, you've got a million nuances and nobody actually follows the rules. And so if you've got a computer saying, hey, tell me the rules, you, I mean, you just, there, there are rules, but they're broken all the time. So that becomes complex. Um, and that's within each new language that's introduced to any system. So we don't really have, I'm sure some people would like to argue with me, but we don't really have 
insightful, adaptive, self-aware machines that can consistently keep up with humans when it comes to translating across languages. It just doesn't exist. Um, and maybe it will, and I think that would be incredible, and I would love to kind of dive into that one day, but that's not, that's not where we're at right now. Um, what are the possibilities? Um, like you just saw, quicker interaction that is workable between different languages with stuff like Google Translate, and over time that becomes more and more accurate, um, and it just continues to shrink the world as countries become more and more interwoven, which is more important than ever, and who knows, maybe there will be a breakthrough. Um, I don't know, but we'll have to see. So is it an art, is it a science? Uh, I'll read you a quote from somebody I was reading, the Association for Computing and Machinery t said this in 1974, but artificial intelligence has been making significant progress, yet there is a huge gap between what computers can do in the foreseeable future and what ordinary people can do. The mysterious insights that people have when speaking, listening, creating, and even when they are programming are still beyond the reach of science. Nearly everything we do is still an art. And as a programmer, I think that's really cool and I would actually kind of really agree with that. I would love to kind of hear what some of you guys think um, as programmers yourself. But in conclusion, they continued. Uh, to summarize, we've seen that computer programming is an art because it applies accumulated knowledge to the world, because it requires skill and ingenuity, and especially because it produces objects of beauty. A programmer who subconsciously views himself as an artist will enjoy what he does and will do it better. Therefore, we can be glad that people who lecture at computer conferences speak about the state of the art. So, um, Some references and any questions you may have. Because, I mean, nobody has the resources that they do. And so Summarize what, what he said. I'm sorry, I should have handed this to you. Um, basically, what he's asking is, is, does, is Google Translate as good as it gets for us right now as far as a like, universal, bi-directional system that goes between any set of languages? And my answer would be yes, um, as far as I'm aware. And it doesn't cover all the languages, obviously, but it covers a good number of them and a lot more than most other systems do. So that's kind of what we've got right now. Thank you. It uh, may not be directly related, but do, do you know what the UN uses for real-time communication? Uh, you, you always see them with the little earpieces in. Yeah. Uh, do you know if they're using software or human? Um, I, have, I do not know. Humans. That's awesome. Good. <laughs> I believe it. Oh my gosh. Wow. Wow. Well, that's awesome. That's very cool. Yeah, so um, you know, I understand the questions about whether it's uh, you know, a, a science or an art, but I would definitely say not to underestimate the impact of the engineering. Um, I'm at the tail end of a, about an 18-month project that translated about 20,000 pages of a, of a basic skills curriculum from English to Spanish. And at first we were working with a vendor who had the science, but their platform did not provide um, enough contextualization to allow post editors to determine, you know, do you want to use this word or that word? Because of course in a yeah. curriculum, you've got to be very consistent with the terminology when we had streams of textual content um, images which we had to convert to SVGs in order to be text-oriented, uh, PDFs, but all of those in separate streams without um, a system to uh, kind of bring those streams and chunk the content, we, it just was not a workable system. And so we ended up having to build uh, additional tools to supplement our existing content manager in order to provide that contextualization and allow the human translators to be able to see English and Spanish side by side. And I don't know if we really built the right system, but uh, 
we had to build something. That's incredible. <laughs> and, uh, but definitely, I mean, uh, so without, no matter how good the science part gets, I mean, you're probably always going to still have the need for the human translators, but it's definitely um, a very important aspect of the system to engineer the right, you know, whether it's web-based or, or desktop-based tools to allow the human editors to work as efficiently as possible. Absolutely. I mean, none of this would exist without the engineers at all. So that's really, that's really fantastic that you did that. I would love to see kind of more what you did. But thank you. That's really cool. So this is uh, kind of a strange question. You may not know the answer, but I still feel like asking it. Because um, I was just thinking about the way human beings deal with new ways of expression. And um, in the German philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein, basically his theory is very similar to machine learning, like we just absorb enough patterns and we get it. Uh, but what we have as an advantage is facial expression when learning new, and like body language. Has there been any attempt to, I don't know, train algorithms with facial expressions as well as uh, verbal communication? Open that up to the room because I'm sure you guys know a lot more than I do. But um, my guess would be that there's definitely some stuff out there that looks like that. Does anyone know? There, there's a lot of work on emotional computing, which trying to get the computer yeah, we've to recognize about that your emotions. Yeah. Uh, particularly like in a learning saying, are you getting frustrated? If so, it'll change the pacing of the questions. Or are you getting angry? Th things like that affect how it branches through the material. So that's sort of an example of. Uh, I'm not sure what they do. I don't know if they use voice stress or whether they really use, I, I think systems vary. I like that question. <laughs> Any others? Cool, all right, thank you, Anna. Thank you. Everybody give it up for Anna. <laughs> Appreciate that, all right. Thank you so much. That was great. Um, yeah, so next week, come back. We'll be back here. Uh, we have dates open in August, uh, late August, I believe. If you want to give a talk, come, come talk to me. Otherwise, we'll see you back at our regularly scheduled programming time.